by Eyewitness News. In November, we began telling you about extravagant spending by the West Virginia Supreme Court. And since then, we've outlined several areas where the court made what you could call questionable decisions concerning your tax dollars. In his on-the-record conversation with Eyewitness News late last year, Chief Justice Alan Lawfrey maintained that he had very little to do with the extensive 2013 renovations of his chambers. I-Team reporter Kenny Bass dug deeper to check the accuracy of those statements. Eyewitness News presented a Freedom of Information Act request to the court to obtain emails, drawings, and other materials connected to the renovation project. In light of these emails, we reached out to Justice Lawfrey to see if he wanted to clarify any of what he said in our November interview. In an email, Lawfrey says he stands by his prior statement that he had no knowledge of the inflated and outrageous expenditures on furniture items such as the couch. Tonight, we present our findings in hopes that you can come to your own conclusions about who was running the show and making the call to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars of your money. How much input did you have into what was going on after you were elected in 2012 and you came in 2013? How much input did you have in the renovations and the furnishing of your office? Well, very little. I mean, when I came into office, uh, this, the renovations were a part of six and a half years of renovations, the first, third, and fourth floors. Uh, more than 96% of those renovations were completed by the time it came to my office. Uh, Mr. Canterbury put things together and came and asked uh, for a, a, approval of uh, maybe do you like this desk or do you like this collar or something like that. Back in November, Supreme Court Chief Justice Alan Lawfrey said he was only minimally involved in the decisions regarding the renovation of his chambers during his first year on the bench. However, an examination of Lawfrey's emails paint a different picture. Many of the communications were with Kim Ellis, the Deputy Director of Administrative Services. On May 21st of 2013, a meeting was scheduled to discuss the construction cost estimate for Lawfrey's chambers. The document was very detailed, with line items for each aspect of the project. Lawfrey indicated the 1 p.m. meeting time was, quote, good for me, end quote. On May 23rd, Lawfrey was sent shop drawings for his requested custom wood cabinets and wall panels. The construction estimate was $117,634 for the customized cabinets and office woodwork he asked for. He was more involved than any of the justices in the remodeling of an office. He was there daily, often more than once. Uh, he could be found there easily enough if you needed to talk to him about anything. Um, and, you know, he, he was very, very specific about what he wanted. Two weeks later, we see drawings and pictures of the now infamous wood medallion of West Virginia. The custom-designed artwork was destined to be placed in the chamber's floor, and Lawfrey told us it was a surprise offering to him from Canterbury. It's nice, but it seems like it's excessive and extra for a private office. I think that the floor is certainly very nice. Uh, I think that the price of, of the floor in my office is uh, uh, commensurate with the price of the floors in all of the other offices, with the exception of one, which is uh, actually more. Um, but Mr. Canterbury was in charge of these expenditures. However, Eyewitness News obtained this drawing, made by Justice Lawfrey himself, which outlines the floor plan for his office. Lawfrey included detailed notes about what he wanted and where he wanted it. The drawing shows where a hidden television would be placed on the wall and where a hidden refrigerator would stand in his assistant's space. Regarding furnishings, Lawfrey wrote that, quote, this could be a single chair, a wider chair, or even two love seats with a couch in the middle. Whatever works with the space. I just want it to look professional and be comfortable, end quote. Of course, this $32,000 couch, adorned with $1,700 throw pillows, was eventually selected. And in the middle of the floor, you can clearly see Lawfrey's rendition of the wood medallion. He was vitally involved with every single aspect of his office remodeling, including the floor, uh, where clearly he wrote this, he drew this up for what he wanted, and this was sort of how it ended up looking. Um, he was, he couldn't have been more involved, and he knew what things cost, uh, not only because he was told, but in many cases, the emails told him the estimates and the costs of, of whatever it was and the specifics of his office. Lawfrey's emails also show he was in direct contact with the Neighborgall Construction Project Manager. The justice had questions about lead paint on radiators, delivery dates, and work updates. 
and he kept a very close eye on the progress of the floor medallion. On June 29th of 2013, Lawfrey sent an email at 1.05 a.m., which went into great detail about his vision for what the final product should look like. Additional emails show Lawfrey receiving a color photograph of his soon-to-be-delivered sectional sofa and even going into the minute detail of the hardware on his cabinetry. The total cost for the renovation of Justice Lawfrey's chambers was $363,000. $13.43. Of that, $75,533.43 paid for his couch, office chairs, cocktail tables, desks, credenza, cornices, wood blinds, pillows, and cabinet hardware. The West Virginia Code of Judicial Conduct's Canon 1 clearly states that a judge shall uphold and promote the independence, integrity, and impartiality of the judiciary and shall avoid impropriety and the appearance of impropriety. We're talking about the Supreme Court of West Virginia. It should be above reproach. It should absolutely be the highest possible standards. Lawfrey's emails and handwritten drawing directly contradict what he has publicly said about his knowledge and involvement in the appearance of his private chambers. I'm incredibly troubled by that, and it's uh, it's so disappointing. I hope that uh, as the stories and so, so forth begin to come out more and more and more, that uh, we demand absolute integrity, honesty, and accountability from not only our court system, but all public officials. Again, we did receive an email from Justice Lawfrey's office standing by his prior statement that he had no knowledge of the inflated and outrageous expenditures, and any insinuation to the contrary is simply dishonest. Reporting in the studio with this I-Team investigation, Kenny Bass. Eyewitness News. The Eyewitness News I team began a series of reports on lavish spending at the West Virginia Supreme Court, along with a lack of policies in place to protect taxpayer dollars. Eyewitness News reporter Kenny Bass is the journalist who broke that story and has done dozens of reports since then on the state's highest court. He joins us now with a look at the last 12 months and where we go from here. Kenny. Callie, what a long, strange trip it has been. As we take a moment to reflect on the massive shakeup in West Virginia's judicial branch, I wanted to talk with the man who helped start the fire. The court's former administrative director, Steve Canterbury, has identified himself as my first source in the Supreme Court investigation. Tonight, we hear from him about why he decided to make that fateful phone call. Since we first introduced you to a certain $32,000 couch, much has changed. Three West Virginia Supreme Court justices have resigned. Minnis Ketchum, Robin Davis, and effective at the end of Business Monday, Alan Lawfrey. Two others, Chief Justice Margaret Workman and Justice Beth Walker, have been impeached. Two former lawmakers, Tim Armstead and Evan Jenkins, have been elected to the bench, working alongside Cabell County Circuit Judge Paul Farrell, who's been serving as a temporary replacement for Lawfrey. Steve Canterbury is the man who made the call to Eyewitness News about the court's lavish spending. On the anniversary of our landmark report, he talks about that decision. I heard that he was about to be considered for a federal judgeship, that he had actually, the word I heard was he was on a short list of those being considered. It alarmed me. Uh, it, it really bothered me. I think people need to know some more about him that they probably don't know. Uh, before making this lifetime appointment. Lawfrey led the effort to fire Canterbury in January 2017, but it was months later when he contacted the I-Team. Canterbury says Lawfrey's actions have damaged the state's entire judicial system. He didn't care how much the state had to spend. He didn't care how much pain he put others through. For his own reasons, he waited this long to resign. Perhaps when he's sitting alone in a cell, he'll have time to reflect that just maybe he should have told the truth instantly, realized at that moment, a year ago, he should just resign, and saved himself a lot of pain. In addition to changes on the bench, voters have now placed the judiciary budget under the supervision of the legislature. It's an effort to control spending and provide accountability to how taxpayer dollars are being used. Canterbury says the court's healing is far from over, but that the process has begun. It's a third branch 
the branch that makes sure that the law is upheld and that we are clear in what the law is. Now, everyone is a little less confident that what they're saying is indeed the rule of law and is indeed right. It's going to take a while to get that back. Governor Jim Justice has the next move, selecting Alan Lawfrey's replacement for the high court. Once that happens, and barring anything unforeseen, the West Virginia Supreme Court should enjoy a relative period of stability until the 2020 primary election when voters will select a candidate to finish out Lawfrey's term to 2024. But we'll continue watching and reporting on the court just in case. Live here in the studio, Kenny Bass, Eyewitness News.